All right, guys, welcome back to our course on cybercrime. I'm Kevin Jennings, and this is one of my favorites. This gets a little bit technical. This gets a little bit um, difficult to understand. So I've split it into much smaller chunks so you can come back and watch this and rewatch this. Um, but uh, here we go. This is, this is, uh, we're going to start with a very short subsection just on imaging. Okay. So I, I mentioned this a little bit in the last section, but this is when you take this, you know, the piece of evidence, say a computer hard drive or some other uh, storage uh, for digital media, digital evidence, and you make a copy, right? But we don't want to just make any old copy. We're going to discuss here in a minute why just a, a normal, you know, copy and paste like you would do on a, uh, as a normal end user for a computer, why that's not sufficient. Um, but we want to go in and we want to look at that storage and we want to copy every single one and zero on that device from our evidence device onto our forensically sterile media. Um, and that's the one we're going to use for our actual analysis, which is going to protect that uh, original evidence, um, making sure it doesn't have anything happen to it, making sure it doesn't have any changes as part of our analysis process. So the first thing we need to do we need to get our forensic uh, sterile media and we need to get a write blocker. And a write blocker is just a piece of um, hardware or software that kind of makes sure that data only travels in one direction. Because we want to make sure that data is only going from the evidence device onto this, uh, you know, a hard drive or USB drive or, or whatever device that we're saving this image on, right? If any data goes in the other direction, that's bad. We want to keep, we, we're so worried about um, evidence integrity that we want to make sure that data only travels from the evidence device onto our drive that we're saving this image on, right? And a write blocker does that. Again, you can do either hardware or software uh, write blockers, but it's just a kind of a guarantee that that data is only traveling in that one direction and you're not going to write any ones and zeros to that original evidence device, right? So we've got our forensically sterile media and hopefully, you know, it, it, in a perfect world, we would use a brand new drive every time we needed to create one of these images uh, to make sure that there is no uh, leftover evidence from previous cases or, or, um, other ones and zeros sitting on uh, that uh, drive that we're creating our image on, but that would be kind of financially um, impossible, right? The, the costs of buying new drives for every single case that a digital forensics lab works would just be astronomical. So we need to reuse drives. And if we're reusing drives, how do we make sure that they're forensically sterile? How do we make sure that they don't have evidence from previous cases still on that drive when we're creating an image for our new case? Well, we use a process called wiping. And this is more than just deleting. Again, we're gonna get into the difference between deleting and, and wiping a little bit more uh, in the next subsection. But um, with wiping, essentially uh, a computer program goes in and every single spot where that drive can store a one or a zero, it puts a zero, right? It, 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 it wipes it out. It, it um, makes sure that there is absolutely no data, no ones, no leftover programs, no leftover pieces of any prior cases, any prior data sitting anywhere on that drive, right? Now, when we're making our image, with uh, desktops and laptops, again, we wanna have what's called a physical image. And in a physical image, this is um, where we go in, we look at the drive uh, and the, the original evidence device, basically this computer program, this imaging program is gonna look at every single spot on that drive and say, is there a one here or a zero here? Copy that over. Is there a one here or a zero here? Copy that over. Is there a one here or a zero here? Copy that over, right? Um, it's much more than just copying and pasting uh, the way, again, a normal end user would do it. Um, but sometimes that's not possible. And this is kind of increasingly the case with certain um, 
you know, cell phones and other mobile devices, uh, just based on the kind of architecture of how that device is manufactured and how it stores data and um, a few other factors. Sometimes all we can do is take, uh, you know, we can't go in and examine every single spot for a one or a zero. We have to do what's called a logical image. And in a logical image, the short version is you're going in and you're saying, uh, you know, it's, it's like, it's more like a normal copy and paste that an end user would do. You're, you're consulting the evidence device and you're saying, hey, can you uh, tell me every one and zero you have on this device, what's saved on here, what files exist, copy all those over, right? And again, the difference between physical and logical might not make sense right now, but it will after the next subsection, I promise. But once we've created our image, once we've copied every single one and zero from the evidence device onto our forensically sterile uh, hard drive, we need to make sure that they are exactly the same. And I don't mean pretty close. I don't mean 99.99%. I mean exactly 100%. Every single one and zero is exactly the same from the evidence device to our new image. And we can do this through a process called hashing. And I've explained hashing in a couple of other sections. This is one of, I think, three different ways we're going to use the process uh, within this cybercrime course. Um, but just to refresh your memory, or if you haven't uh, watched those other sections, the hashing process involves uh, kind of really complicated mathematics that I don't understand. I mean, you need a PhD in mathematics to even begin to understand the actual mathematics involved in how this hashing process works. But the short version is you take some input. It could be one letter. It could be the entire library of Congress. Um, it could be all the ones and zeros on a hard drive. But you take that input, you send it through this really complicated mathematical process, and that process spits out an output, right? And that output is going to look like, to the untrained eye, kind of just a random series of numbers and letters. Now, this process is useful for a bunch of different reasons, but for the imaging process, it's useful because every time you put in the same input, you'll get the exact same output. But if you change the input even a teeny tiny little bit, i.e., uh, you know, you take the entire book series uh, and change one letter in those thousands and thousands of pages worth of text, you change one letter and the output isn't going to be just a little bit different, it's going to be completely different. So any teeny tiny change in the input is going to result in an output that is vastly different, right? So... If, he, if we hash, if we send the, the, the original evidence drive, all those ones and zeros through this hashing process, we'll get a certain output. If we then send all the ones and zeros from our image through that same hashing process, as long as every single one and zero is the same, it'll result in the exact same output. But if even one single one or zero has been changed or doesn't appear or got erased or changed or whatever, that output is going to be completely different than the, the output for the original evidence device, right? So we want to be able to prove mathematically that the, the original evidence and our image that we're going to do our analysis on are exactly the same. So we send them both through this, this hashing process. If the two outputs are the same, then um, we can be really, really, really sure that every single one and zero is the same. So here... And this image above me, um, this is one that I actually uh, uh, computed myself using uh, an imager program called FTK Imager, which is free to download if you'd like to uh, create your own images. Um, and as you can see, we have here um, the hash for the evidence device, which begins 7282EE0, blah, 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 blah. And then the image we made has the output 7282EE09, whatever, whatever. So in other words, these two match perfectly using this MD5 hashing algorithm, the original device and our image have the exact same output. But to be even more sure, we're gonna use a second hashing algorithm. 
goes through, you know, the, the idea here is the same. It's just the specific math that computes that hash is going to be slightly different between these different hashing algorithms. But the theory is the same, right? So we're going to do this a second time. The original evidence sent through the second hashing algorithm, A270, blah, 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 blah. And then our image, A270, blah, blah. So it's the exact same for this hashing algorithm and the exact same for this hashing algorithm. So now we are doubly sure using these two different but related processes that our original evidence and the output are exactly the same. So now we can go ahead and do our analysis. Um, if these numbers don't match, it's probably just a random error, a random you know, uh, glitch that happened during the imaging process. Um, and you can just start again. Right? We still have that original evidence device. We haven't changed anything thanks to our write blocker. So we can just kind of delete the image we created and try again. Put that evidence device, uh, connect it to the right blocker again, find a, find a new uh, forensically sterile drive to create our image on, start the process over again. And that'll uh, hopefully result in an exact image again. Now, one thing that uh, is kind of theoretically a worry is the concept of collisions and collisions, you know, because the input, there's literally an infinite number of possible inputs. Whereas the outputs are a fixed number of characters, a fixed series of numbers and letters here, right? So the MD5 hash is always going to be this number of characters, this uh, number of number and letters. The SHA-1 hash is always going to be this number of numbers and letters, right? It's kind of a mathematical certainty that there are two different inputs that will result in the same output. But the odds of this are so exceedingly vanishingly low that we don't really have to worry about it, right? Um, to, I'll, get, I'll put it to you this way. You as an individual right now go to some random spot on the earth and pick up a single grain of sand. Now, I will go to a completely random spot on the earth and pick up a single grain of sand. The odds of us having completely randomly chosen the exact same grain of sand are much, much, much more likely than two different inputs giving us the same output with these modern hashing algorithms. So yes, it is theoretically possible for two different inputs to produce the same output, but the odds of this are so vanishingly small, we don't have to worry about. It. But that might be something that comes up during testimony, during, uh, you know, uh, if somebody's trying to uh, accuse you of having done your analysis on a modified uh evidence device or you somehow changed the evidence when you were creating this image and that's why um, the the person uh, being tried for this crime is really innocent um, you can talk about how you know this hashing process assures us that the image that we did our analysis on is exactly the same as that original evidence and the odds of having you know, having a change between the two and having, uh, despite that change, still getting the exact same hash are so vanishingly small as to be essentially zero. Okay. All right. That's the imaging process. That was a short one. Uh, we will discuss more about analysis in the next subsection. Thank you so much for watching.